everyone. I'm Grace Beatty, and welcome to Wicked Women, the podcast. Step back in time with me as we learn about some of the most infamous and maligned women in history. Speaking with leading experts, I will discuss these women's backstories and the circumstances that gave them the title of Wicked. In this season of Wicked Women, I will be focusing on some well-known and some lesser-known women in history who have acquired an unsavory reputation. This season will analyze the lives and legacies of Alexandra Fyodorovna Romanov, the last Tsaritsa of Russia, Queen Mary I, more popularly known as Bloody Mary, Catherine Howard, Henry VIII's fifth wife, who was executed for adultery, Empress Wu Zhao, also known as Wu Zixian, the only Chinese empress to rule in her own name, and Empress Theodora, a former sex worker who became empress of the Byzantine Empire. In the end, this podcast does not look to excuse or dispute the wrongs committed by some of these women, but it is also not looking to completely villainize them. Instead, I hope this can be a conversation starter on the complicated legacies prescribed to women in history. Content warning! This episode includes some sexual content that may not be appropriate for all ages. In this episode, I will be discussing Catherine Howard, Henry VIII's fifth wife. Joining me today will be historian Gareth Russell, the author of the critically acclaimed book on Catherine Howard, Young and Damned and Fair, and Dr. Nikki Clark, a senior lecturer in early modern history at the University of Chichester, who has researched the women in the Howard family extensively. Continue listening to learn more about this fascinating and much maligned woman from history. On the morning of the 28th of February, 1540, the teenaged Catherine Howard married the middle-aged King Henry VIII. Within 16 months, the girl who had won the heart of an aging king was dead, caught up in a tidal wave of rumors, intrigue, and revenge. Born into the powerful Howard family, Catherine grew up in relative obscurity in the English countryside. Her meteoric rise from a lesser-known member of the Howard clan to the new Queen of England was anything but expected. Catherine has been mythologized since her death in countless ways. She has been portrayed as a sex-crazed teenager, a pawn in the dangerous game of court politics, and a Juliet-style star-crossed lover. But most of Catherine's real story is unknown, making her perhaps Henry's least known and most maligned queen. Catherine's whole story begins with a mystery. There is no record of her birth, only small hints left in family wills and letters. Historians estimate Catherine could have been born anywhere between 1519 and 1525, which Dr. Nikki Clark points out. So a difference in age of up to nine years obviously then gives you very different interpretations of what went on. And yes, it's not recorded because she's not important enough at that point to have to have bothered writing it down. Um, so yeah, we are reliant on anecdotal evidence and on, on putting things into the best context that we can. Some people think 1525. I, I land on a sort of roughly in the early 1520s, I think, is the nearest approximation based on things like when her parents married, how many kids were born before Catherine, how old they were, things like that. Um, her older sister, Margaret, got married in the early 1530s. If you then situate Catherine next to that, makes the early 1520s about right for her birth. You know, it's all it's all vague. We will never completely know. But I think it's more likely she's perhaps 17 or 18 in 1539, rather than like, you know, 12 or whatever it is. So I think, I think she's slightly older perhaps than sometimes, sometimes we think she is. Yes, incredibly young, but in context, not so young. While Gareth Russell states... The theory that, that really acquired a lot of popularity in the 1990s, that she was born in 1525, which would have made her about 14 or 15 when Henry married her in 1540, and would have made her about, you know, 16, maybe 17, 
when she was executed. And so I was under the impression initially that I was dealing with a child. With a child, and, and I think it is worth pointing out that there is a um, there's a pretty common misconception that gets bandied around in Tudor historiography, which is that because you were considered old enough to be married, girls were considered old enough to be married at 12, that the concept of youth um, and the fragility of youth uh, and even sort of extended childhood that we have, that that simply was not recognised. And that is not the case. Um, there was still a general perception that 12, 13, 14, and even 15 were young. And certainly, you know, 17, 18, 19, they would have been regarded, a 17 or 18 year old would have been regarded under in Tudor society as having the sort of level of maturity that we would expect of someone in their late 20s. So you can't over egg that. But I really was, you know, initially I thought I was dealing with someone who was, you know, um, married to Henry VIII when she was potentially 14 years old. And that, you know, I, I came to realise that it, it is not sustainable that she was born that late. And I think actually quite a few um, historians, absolutely to their credit, who previously supported 1525, now I think that the evidence points to it probably being 1522. And in a life that short, those three years obviously do make um, a, a difference. Not only is her birthday uncertain, but her early years remain shrouded in mystery. What is known is that Catherine was the daughter of Edmund Howard, the third son of the mighty second Duke of Norfolk, and Jocasta, or Joyce, Culpepper. Catherine's mother passed away sometime in or around 1528, and her debt-ridden father sent Catherine to live with her step-grandmother, the Dowager Duchess of Norfolk. A common practice of the time, the Duchess provided lodgings and education for countless noble girls and assisted in finding them affluent marriages. There have been numerous misconceptions about Catherine's early years with the Dowager Duchess. Here's Gareth Russell. So one of the, one of the, one of the long lasting, really damaging versions um, of Catherine's story was written in the nineteenth century by a historian called Agnes Strickland in sort of the first popular history bestseller, a series of books called The Lives of the Queens of England. And the Victorians were much more open about making history suit their view of the world than later historians. And for a you know, a very class conscious, generally pretty um, sexually conservative society like the Victorian period, the way Catherine brought up was sort of quadruply offensive. And uh, there was no way that Strickland could possibly conceive of why on earth a Duke's granddaughter would be put into a dormitory. That just to her was uh, was mind boggling. And it, and it must have... Um, it must, she assumed, have been a sign of neglect by the Dowager Duchess of Norfolk, who of course took Catherine in, in the early 1530s as a ward. Uh, she also, you know, didn't seem to realise that beds were an extraordinary expense and that most, even high-ranking members of the household, slept in pallets or basically in glorified sleeping bags. And the fact that we know that this dormitory was filled with beds for Catherine and her companions suggests actually a very, very privileged um, and indulged childhood. So context is, is key there. The other thing to bear in mind about the Victorian period that we're still sort of having to, I mean, I have to remind, had to remind myself as I was doing it, um, and still have to remind myself in conversation to make it clear, is that the Victorian period was incredibly... Um, class conscious, and there were clear delineations between family and servants. There weren't wards in the way that they were in um, in Tudor society. And so how Agnes Strickland presented it is, little Catherine was put into a dormitory, which is where you put the servants, with servants. And of course, the lower classes are called that because they have lower morals, 
So they corrupted her because no duke's granddaughter would ever willingly have sex of her own volition outside of marriage. That just wouldn't be done. She was, and she Strickland says this in the chapter. She's very open. She says that, you know, I want this to be a cautionary tale to, to young girls from good families. And and we, you know, Francis Durham is still referred to as a servant because and Joan Bulmer and um Catherine Stilney, they're all they're all referred to as servants. And in fact, they all came from the gentry, they all came from relatively privileged backgrounds. So this so really the the whole perception of Catherine is living in sort of genteel poverty and gilded, ramshackled neglect feeds it is first of all wrong and not sustained at all by what we know of the of the way the Dodger Duchess of Norfolk ran her household. But it also feeds into this idea that she was bordering on illiterate and that um her step grandmother, the Dodger Duchess, who manifestly took so little care of her that she wouldn't even pro- you know she wouldn't even provide her with her own bedroom by Victorian standards, the would of course never have bothered to have her educated. And in fact, the Catherine I saw, you know, calligraphy or decent handwriting took work. Um, we, we we do know, so sorry, just to be clear, I am not in any way saying that we're dealing with someone who was particularly interested in uh, intellectual pursuits. She wasn't. There is very little evidence whatsoever that she was interested in theology or philosophy or history or genealogy or any of the kind of the, the, those big topics for, for the Tudor upper classes. But we know she was, a, you know, she was um, an excellent um, dancer. We know that she had a really sophisticated, nimble grasp of etiquette. And whilst we usually dismiss etiquette as as frivolous and in fact it's incredibly complicated there are lots of you know you might think it's it, it, it's ridiculous but in the same way if you don't you know if you're not someone who has the same religion as a historical person you're studying you still have to take the religion seriously because they did and etiquette governed every single aspect of how Catherine and her contemporaries interacted with each other she was very aware of that. Who sits where? What you know? Where? How? Which way do you turn to someone? How do you address a duke versus a marquis versus an earl versus a viscount versus a baron? Who do you call lord, lady, in what order? It is not a simple process. It's a lot, and she was praised by very cynical observers at the English court. She was praised by diplomats for how well she handled it. So clearly, there was by contemporary standards a pretty decent education. No, she wasn't as intellectually inquisitive as Anne Boleyn or Catherine Parr, but there's absolutely no reason to believe and quite a lot of reason to disbelieve that she was badly educated or or um, stupid. It was during her time at the Dowager Duchess's home that Catherine had her first sexual encounters. In 1536, the same year her cousin Anne Boleyn was executed, the Dowager Duchess hired a man named Henry Mannix to be Catherine's music teacher. Mannix came to personify the kind of men that Catherine would be attracted to in her young life. Men who were cocky, possessive, paranoid, and handsome. Because of the uncertainty of Catherine's birth, she may have been as young as 13 when she began a sexual relationship with Mannix, who was in his mid-twenties. The evidence suggests that while their relationship was an intense one, it was never consummated. By 1538, Catherine broke off her relationship with Mannix and had moved on to another man named Francis Derham. Derham and some other young men would sneak into the women's dormitories at night and sleep with many of the young women. Catherine and Derham's relationship soon surpassed the one with Mannix in its intensity, passion, and obsessiveness. They were regularly seen together in Catherine's bed and began calling each other husband and wife. When warned by another young woman about the possibility of getting pregnant, Catherine dismissed her concerns, stating, A woman can meddle with a man, and yet conceive no child, unless she would herself. In discussion about Catherine's sexual experiences, Dr. Nikki Clark said this, I think actually her choices are more common than we think. I think it is not uncommon for aristocratic girls to 
if not lose, it depends what you're calling virginity, doesn't it? But if not, kind of go all the way before marriage to have had some sort of experience. I think we think of them in this very closeted world. And there are ways in which that was the case. Um, even Catherine's grandmother did, you know, she did try. She locked the maidens in their chamber a night. It isn't her fault that they stole the key. Uh, yeah, she gets blamed a lot. And I think I think that's unfair. But, I, you know, Catherine, even in that household, is not the only one who is sleeping around with the boys before marriage, before anything else. There's a really catty comment made by the Spanish ambassador, Eustace Chapuis, about Jane Seymour, saying that he thought it would be a miracle if she was still a virgin, having spent so long at court. So, you know, I think there's a slight ideal reality gap here, but I think it's one that's really difficult to see and to prove conclusively from the kind of evidence we have available to us, because it's not something people wrote down. The beginning of 1540 saw Catherine tiring of Durham and his possessive ways. That same year, the Duke of Norfolk found a place for his young niece in the household of the new queen, Anne of Cleves. With an exciting new future laid out before her, Catherine broke off her relationship with Durham and went to court. As Gareth Russell states in his book, she did not make clear to Francis that she considered this a permanent goodbye. Francis, who was both enraged and devastated by this turn of events, still believed there was a chance he would one day be Catherine's husband. It is believed by many historians that the Duke of Norfolk was unaware of Catherine's scandalous past when he found her a position at court. One of the most exciting things I discovered whilst, whilst writing the book is that her uncle, the Duke of Norfolk, who you know is usually presented as as the, the guy at the chessboard to extend to stand the pawn metaphor, wasn't in England when when this when the king's interest in Catherine started. He was on a um, he was on a diplomatic mission to France, and he, actually the entire family seemed to have been caught off guard by this. I think Henry, you know, she was very beautiful and um, very charming, and I think he noticed the king noticed her. And then it, at a later date, it began to develop into something more serious. But they, I think the Howards were actually caught off guard. Now, what I say in the book is, I, I think, my, my um, gut feeling after reading as much as you can on their response is that once they realised what was happening, they definitely played it to their advantage. But I think initially there was a there was surprise that this was happening. And I think... Um, that it is almost impossible to dislodge that. So, I mean, it's in it's in chapter six of the book. I, I try to explain as, as much as I can why. I Chapter six and chapter seven, why Catherine's rise to the throne is so interesting and it's so much more uh, stop and start and fascinating than the, the myth we have of it. But, but that myth that she was picked by her family to seduce the king is a um is, is is probably the most enduring fallacy we have about her but when it comes to history particularly the Tudors, we are always trying to assume conspiracy and to write it with hindsight and we never allow their lives to have accidents or happenstance and actually in many ways that's a much more interesting and difficult history to write it's really easy to say a annoyed b so and then a died later so b probably murdered them or you know d married e and at one point f was in the same room so they plotted it that's a really easy way to write history it's just not a particularly realistic way to write about human life and we're all guilty of it we're all guilty of, of wanting to see those really easily drawn lines when it comes to to the lives of the past but i think the catherine who sort of thrown onto the shores of history by fluke chance is in many ways a much more interesting story than um, the sort of Machiavellian plot line we've had for a while with how she came to Henry's notice. It wasn't long before the young teenager began attracting the attentions of the ageing king. For us, perhaps some of Catherine's legacy should be as a lesson about nuance in the study of the past. You know, it's rarely all one thing or all another. Um, I think the Duke of Norfolk, yes, as the head of her family, 
was perhaps involved in getting her a place at court, but I really don't think he's pulling tons of strings behind the scene. He's actually not there for a lot of the time that she's queen. Um, and he doesn't seem to have known about any of the premarital stuff. Others of her relatives, I think, did. I also don't think that they put her in court in order to get her into the king's bed. I think that's a real nice kind of hindsight vision. At the time that Catherine joined the court in Anne of Cleves' household, they couldn't possibly have known that that marriage wasn't going to work. Besides which, it, what's just happened to Anne Boleyn and then to Jane Seymour, like, really, you want to put your young women in the king's bed so they can end up dead? I mean, it seems like an odd choice. I think it's more that the king sees Catherine and goes, yes, that one. And her family go, oh, God, really? Really? Are you sure? And all you can really do at that point, I think, is ride the wave as best you can. So I think they, not the Duke of Norfolk, but some of the others try quite hard to silence some of the people around them who know about Catherine's former life. Uh, and in the end, it does all backfire. Time had not been kind to Henry VIII. When he ascended the throne in 1509, everyone praised him for his vigor, intelligence, and attractiveness. Now, nearing 50, the king was incredibly obese and had an ulcerous leg, not the ideal suitor for a vivacious teenager. Catherine's appearance, meanwhile, is highly debated by historians. No portrait depicting the young queen has ever been verified. It is believed that she was petite and may have had light auburn hair, but it is impossible at this time to know for sure. Within six months after paying court to Catherine in secret, massive air quotes there, Henry's marriage was annulled, and he married Catherine in August 1540. We can never know what Catherine felt as she walked down the aisle to her towering, middle-aged, obese bridegroom. Today, the image is sickening, a dazzling beauty sacrificed to the whims of a monstrous king. Yet Henry was infatuated with Catherine, and it was reported by the French ambassador Charles de Marillac that he caresses her more than he did the others. Catherine's first months as queen were highly successful. She fit the standards of the time for a queen consort. Her kindness and generosity were widely discussed by her contemporaries. Catherine would intercede on behalf of prisoners, a trademark act by queens at the time, and sent clothes to prisoners in the Tower of London. Most importantly for Henry, she was obedient and agreeable, taking on the motto, no other will but his, after her marriage. She was praised in the early months of her marriage for her grace, beauty, gentleness, and joyful spirit. However, despite her early success as queen, her dramatic downfall often overshadows these facts. In the early part of 1541, Catherine was riding on a high in her public life when she began to make dire mistakes in her private one. A man named Thomas Culpepper had caught her eye when she first arrived at court in 1540, but the intense infatuation from the king soon put an end to any thought of further romance with Culpepper. After a few months of being queen, Catherine began communicating with Culpepper again. This begins one of the most infamous and mysterious parts of Catherine's life. It has been widely accepted that she and Culpepper began a passionate and dangerous sexual relationship. The actual events and manners of this relationship have never been proven. I think there's definitely emotions involved in her relationship with Culpepper, however far it did or didn't go. Um, she seems to have first encountered him when she came to court, but before she caught the king's eye, so while he's still married to Anne of Cleves. They seem to have had some sort of rapport going on, but then he went off and slept with someone else. Uh, and apparently she was pretty heartbroken about that. She she wrote somewhere that, you know, she she could hardly keep from crying. She didn't want other people to see her crying. And, you know, if uh, you really like me, so why did you go off with Bess Harvey? Like, they did talk about that. They have a conversation about it. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, quite, it's quite sweet. He does seem, at least at the beginning, to have kind of been in there for what he could get. Um, and that may have shifted for him as well. It's hard to tell. Their story has been told in a number of ways, as the ultimate star-crossed lover's tale, a sexual predator preying on a naive and young victim, or a scandalous, stupid, sex-crazed romp. All that the records show from the time is that Catherine and Culpepper were alone together on numerous nights during 1541. The rest is unknown. That was enough. 
Yeah, I mean, as a queen, if you're meeting a man and, and trying to meet a man in what passed for privacy, that itself is quite a damning action, really. And that was the kind of evidence they were using, though. The fact that she did this at all is itself not a good thing. <laughs> Catherine's downfall came as rapidly as her rise. A single rumour from a single source proved to be her undoing. On the 1st of November, 1541, Henry VIII found a letter in his privy chapel claiming that before their marriage, his young wife had sexual encounters with two men. Thus, Catherine's early relationships with Mannix and Derham came to light. Henry was horrified, but initially refused to believe the rumors. He ordered a quiet investigation into his young wife and the veracity of the claims. The investigation uncovered that Henry Mannix had boasted about seeing a secret mark on Catherine's body. Francis Derham was accused of having consummated his relationship with Catherine. Catherine, terrified and confined to her rooms, confessed and fell upon the king's mercy. So there is more than one confession that Catherine made. Attention is usually focused on the final, more polished one, and that excludes the more natural-sounding earlier version. And you can see that she changed her own testimony as she went along. Henry, furious, quickly left Hampton Court, and Catherine would never see him again. After intense torture, Derham confessed to having carnal knowledge of the Queen, while also naming Thomas Culpepper as his replacement in the Queen's affection. Mannix, however, was allowed to go free. Here's Gareth Russell on why he thinks Mannix got away with his relationship with the young Catherine. Because they hadn't had full intercourse, and it's that simple. What it's, we have, uh, it, it's sometimes having to, to retrain your mind slightly to look at the ways in which there was a legal morality and a moral legalism in the 16th century that was very different to the way we view it. So we view sexual contact as under the same umbrella. You know, we tend to, we tend to, you know, we don't really think that there was a massive, you know, amount of difference between the levels of physical intimacy that we hear with Mannix versus Durham or Culpepper. However, they did. And uh, the 16th century had a, a placed a huge amount of emphasis on full sexual intercourse um, and really much less on acts of physical intimacy that that did not end with um with full sex or, or, or to be honest without being sort of unnecessarily graphic but the, the the point was usually ejaculation was the point at which as is at which from what we can tell the law both both canon law which is religious law and secular law begin to converge and say that there has been some sort of that there has been um uh, sexual contact. So because Mannix did not have sex with her, it, it, they they couldn't really construct a case. And so, and it was also before the marriage as well. So um, Culpepper, they accused him of intending to sleep with her after she was married, um, uh, of Derham of having done so before and then not alerting the government. And Mannix just under the kind of the sort of, some people call it like, Biolegalism or biomoralism of the 16th century, it just it doesn't fall into the same categories as we would see it. And that is one of those things that when you're writing about it, you have to remind yourself that those attitudes have really shifted over the centuries. Culpepper and Catherine denied consummating their affair, but their fates were sealed. They had dared to cuckold a king and had to pay. You know, it is often cited. Thomas More and Anne Boleyn's last protestations of innocence on the sacrament. And Catherine did the same. You know, she swore at her last confession with Dr. White. I did not, I think she, I'm paraphrasing, but she essentially said that she didn't pollute the king's bed. I, I just, I, from everything I read and those interrogation records and also, you know, the evidence from, from before the interrogations, I think she was telling the truth. I can't prove that you are in, you know, of course, uh, there have been readers who have said, you know, I think she was lying. 
I, I don't think that at that moment, you know, when you're taking the last sacrament, you lie. Who knows? But but yes, she and Culpepper never swerved that they that they had not slept together. Um, Culpepper actually, quite interestingly, in his interrogation, said, you know, we wanted to, but we didn't. And I think that probably, and uh, Edward Seymour, who was then Earl of Hartford, said, well, that, that is too much. Because essentially, after the break with the Roman Catholic Church, Henry was facing such opposition that he changed the treason laws in England and in Wales to say your thoughts could be treason. And if you did anything that looked like you were later going to commit treason, then you could be condemned for treason. And so Hartford was able to say to Culpepper, you wanting to do it is enough. It wasn't technically treason for her, but it was for him because it technically could be spun that he had been planning to tamper with the line of succession to the throne by producing it, potentially producing an illegitimate child. So I think it's, I saw nothing that would contradict that he was, I think, telling the truth. And I think she was telling the truth. I are, my gut feeling, if I'm honest, Grace, is that potentially at some, if they hadn't been caught in November, 1541, it might, might have become, a full affair. They certainly seem to have been, you know, genuinely very interested in each other. And I think sometimes we have a tendency to to downplay just the obfuscating influence of being infatuated or in love or just the the, 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 the ability of romance to make us do atypical things sometimes. You know, writing love letters and thing, you know, things like that. And so I, I my instinct is that when Culpepper said they might you know they wanted to and that they would have at some point, I think that was the truth. But it is worth noting that she, like Anne Boleyn, was very clear it had not happened. Durham and Culpepper were executed on December 10th of 1541. Two months later, Catherine was moved to the tower and housed in the same rooms occupied by Anne Boleyn. Unlike Anne Boleyn, Catherine did not have a trial. While she is known for being executed for adultery, the real charges brought against her were much more complicated. I think because the law is geared in such a way to make that possible. The charge is not itself one of adultery, it's high treason. Um, and, and it's high treason along the lines of a really old treason statute from 1352. Um, and the, the relevant clause is the imagining the death of the king, which sounds really bizarre to us, but it basically means if you as a woman, as his wife, sleep around and conceive a child that is not the king's, you have then caused the death of the king's lineage, which is seen as synonymous with the royal body. Maybe not the the individual body of this particular king, but the office of of kingship and the lineage, the lineage of the Tudor dynasty. And so it's a kind of it to our ears, it's it's really quite convoluted. But that's what they're they're going for. And the threat of having done it, like imagining doing it, is is treason in itself. You don't have to actually do it. Um, so yeah, that's what they were trying to prove. I think also it is very difficult to prove that two people have had sex in. Um, I hesitate to say privacy because it's it's not quite the same concept then as now. But, you know, where there weren't many other people around, how would you know? The night before the execution, Catherine requested to have the execution block brought to her room. She wished to practice so that she could die with dignity. On the morning of February 13th, 1541, a second Queen of England was led to the scaffold in less than 10 years. With one swift stroke, the deed was done. Catherine Howard, Queen of England and fifth wife of Henry VIII, breathed her last. She may not have even been 21. Catherine Howard is perhaps the most maligned and misunderstood of Henry VIII's six wives, Since the Victorian era, there has been a predominantly unsympathetic view of Henry's youngest wife. She has been labelled by historians as a frivolous, empty-headed young girl, a good-time girl, and a natural-born tart. In the era of the Me Too movement, she's represented as a victim of sexual violence. Each perspective, whore or victim, reduces the young queen to nothing more than a sexual object. In reality, she was an altogether more complex young woman. When discussing the double standards prescribed to men and women in history, 
Gareth Russell said this. Well, this, well, this is it. I mean, even you know, the first thing that if you mention her name, the 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 there are one of two responses. One is per child, um, per her. Per, you know, the other one is sorry, she she was stupid. Um, she sort of deserved it, and I think, well, you know, I'm not. I, I'm not pretending that every woman who lived in the 16th century was a monster uh, or a saint. Um, I'm not pretending either of those things, and vice versa for the men. I'm not pretending saint or monsterhood for them either. However, I do not remember anyone saying that Wolsey was stupid, or Cromwell was stupid, or the Marquis of Exeter was stupid, or Robert Ask was stupid, or any of the many, many, or Nicholas Carew. There is never the same jump to say that men who were that close to an erratic tyrant, which is what Henry VIII was, um, in my opinion, um, we never say that the men who were destroyed for making political mistakes, and in some cases, you know, very obvious ones, we don't say that they were stupid and they kind of deserved it. But when it becomes a mistake that was made within a private sphere, then all of a sudden we're in a position where we can say stupid uh, to the point that sometimes it does feel like we're saying, well, I don't really need to feel bad for her because she kind of brought this on herself. Uh, so so th- it's interesting. There's, there are one of two answers, that, one of two reactions, broadly speaking, that Catherine still provokes. In discussion about Catherine's unchanged legacy throughout history, Dr. Nikki Clark said this. I think partly because when we tell stories and and things like this that have gone into kind of national legend and national myth, they become kind of archetypal stories. And those are the stories we want to we want to fit them into that mold. So I, I think it's partly that. I think it probably stems partly from contemporary beliefs as well. I mean, all of the the women being inferior and having no minds of their own it goes so far back embedded in our social understanding of gender roles doesn't it so I think it's not surprising that perhaps that's what came down to us and the available material that we have tells us not an awful lot about Catherine herself so then it's easy to kind of amplify that in either direction I guess. Most of what we know about Catherine Howard comes from court documents compiled during her downfall. During that time men told her story with every reason to paint her as the creator of her demise. Henry's other wives have had their reputations rehabilitated in recent years, while Catherine's has remained essentially unchanged. Anne Boleyn is praised as a feminist icon, a woman who knew her own mind and developed her own sexual ethic. Catherine, meanwhile, is condemned for the same. While the innocence of Anne Boleyn is persistently debated, the condemnation of Catherine appears unworthy of discussion. Here's Gareth Russell in discussion about the difference between Catherine's legacy and Anne Boleyn's. Anne Boleyn is in some ways a very unique historical figure in terms of her reputation. Eleanor of Aquitaine and Cleopatra are sort of the same, um, so maybe I couldn't say unique, but essentially she functions in some historiographical responses like an honorary man. So she is seen as someone who whose downfall was predominantly political and that she was a very strong personality in contrast to her cousin Catherine. And so it, the same pity is not warranted. And also, I think she therefore almost slots into a version of Tudor history in which she ranks alongside Wolsey and Fisher and Moore and Cromwell and Exeter as a political casualty. But she also is a woman. And so she, uh, uh, on top of the a historiographical response uh, as an honorary man, she does sometimes still evoke um, responses that are quite miso- quite or very misogynist or critical so she should have kept her mouth shut and you know jokes about Anne Boleyn tend to be sexual in nature they tend to be you know so that so I think on her gender 
leaves her reputation open to the same forces of sexualized criticism we see for Catherine. But her portrayal and presentation as a sort of honorary man slash politician denies her any sympathy. So it's really, it's it's an interest. It, it, Anne is, Anne, like Eleanor Vakwatin and Cleopatra, is um, caught somewhere between the, the two responses. And I think it hasn't done her it hasn't helped her reputation either way because she sort of was getting the worst of of both but and i and i think you know you're right i mean anyone who has who has dabbled with Tudor history has seen how anne boleyn is is a kind of a hot button um it's just, even it's even it's just a very odd um scenario but with catherine i think you know we are still dealing with someone who excuse me we are still a society that as much as attitudes have changed there is still a tendency to define historical women solely in relation to the men around them and to some degree i was certainly guilty of that when i saw catherine as solely a victim because whether you see her as you know promiscuous and stupid, or whatever, or whatever way that um, portrayal falls, or you see her as, per Catherine, such a victim, that's all she was, you are still allowing the men around her to define the entire story. And I think there, there is, of, of course, you have to look at the fears that sexuality provoked, the neuroses that sexuality provoked, because that is what killed her in the end. But but it is it is a shame to not even try to lift her out of the shadow of Mannix or Derham or Culpepper. In her fictional portrayals, Catherine is either relegated to the characterization of a dim-witted tart, warranting judgment, or a naive victim deserving of pity. In neither case is she given agency or sympathy for her real-life choices. One of the most recent and best-known portrayals of Catherine Howard was in the successful TV series The Tudors, in which she was depicted as an over-sexualized, frivolous, uneducated, foolish girl. While only appearing in six episodes, Catherine appears naked on screen more than any other character. In the series, her affair with Culpepper begins out of boredom and lack of sexual satisfaction from Henry, leaving viewers with little sympathy for her downfall. Her depiction in this widely watched series is just the latest in a long line of fictional portrayals that reinforce her stereotype as a sexual deviant who brings about her own destruction. And older tropes and stereotypes can take a very long time to, to dislodge, so part of it's simply chronological. The other is that I, I, my impression from a lot of people is that they, they almost want to, to disassociate with this because the, the thing with Catherine is that when you look at the story in its stark outlines it's a horror show I mean it's really you know I think people are almost um you see this I, I I saw this with Titanic actually it's um it was the steel it was the rudder it was a fire it was and there's so many different reasons that people try to come up with to make it less obvious. And you think, no, no, it hit an iceberg and sank because it was going too fast. It's not It's not any of these other like multitudinous conspiracy theories you're coming up with to take the sting out of it. That really obvious arc that if they had just slowed down a little bit, that's it, it would have been fine. Um, and, and Catherine, in a strange way, I think functions as that because people don't want to see, the. a lot of people don't want to see the obvious arc they don't want, which is that there was no, which is one of the things I stress in the book, and I go into it in a bit more detail. Do not fall for this argument that re that repeatedly gets stated, um, trotted out in the negative version of her, which is she knew what she was doing. It was very stupid. She knew it was a death penalty offense, and she still did it anyway. None of not one word of that is true. Because even if she had slept with Thomas Culpepper, and I don't believe that she did, but even if she had slept with Thomas Culpepper, that was not treason under the, under the laws of the 1540s. It was made treason after her 
um, execution. And they didn't put her on trial. Uh, there had to be pressure brought from the House of Lords to even offer her one. There was, you know, Henry really squeezed the law to to make sure she got the, the block. And right up until the very end, every a lot of people thought that she would be pardoned because it seemed so clear to them that what she had done in those nighttime meetings with Thomas Culpepper when she was married to King Henry VIII did not constitute treason, nor did they constitute adultery. I mean, by the way, there were there are many moments, I go into them in the book, where she did do things that were stupid. Everyone in their life has done stupid things. Um, but I, but I, I don't think anyone should, be, most people should not be judged by their most stupid moments. And I think Catherine is the victim of a, a long-term tendency uh, to obviously judge, we know this from history, it's, it's, I'm not saying anything that's sort of uh, historical rocket science here. Women are generally judged a lot more harshly for um, their, sexual, their sexuality and expressions of it than men are, to put it mildly, particularly in the 16th century. She is, I think, also the um, recipient or victim of a historical process whereby people sometimes don't want to look at the sheer stark horror of an injustice on that scale. And also, I think, when you look, when you look at Catherine in terms of this role that she's played in English history, she, we like people to stay in the stereotypes of the visions that we've had of them for a long time. So I think that's, that's partly, why, partly why that version of her has endured. Henry VIII's wives have been constantly reinvented, but not Catherine Howard. Only in recent years has she begun to be reanalyzed, but the age-old myth continues in tandem. I think we could use her as a way to think about women as whole human beings rather than as stereotypes. I think that would be a good legacy. That's, that's a good thing to do at any point in the past. And that people could, you know, make a bad decision and then a good one, or people could change their minds, or... For so long, it was a moralizing tale. You know, Victorian women would write about Catherine and, oh, well, don't do that then, you know. Catherine's fleeting life has left later generations with barely a shadow of her true self. As the line from the blockbuster musical Six states, Catherine has remained a line in a rhyme, the second beheaded of Henry's wives, not a real fleshed out woman. Her life has become legend, inextricably linked to the larger narrative of Henry VIII's love life. Catherine's existence was defined by some of the greatest highs and heartbreaking lows. She was not the naive, pure, quiet woman of the medieval stereotype. From reports of her, she could light up a room with her beauty, grace, and kindness. But she could also be vain, quick-tempered, vindictive, and reckless. She is a woman we could all know today.